Good morning there, Epsom Bible Church. So good to see all of you here this morning. Let's all stand together, if you would, as we begin our time of praise and worship this morning with Christ our glory. Think about that this morning.
that's all that I know. into our lives and called us out of a life of sin and shame. I know that some of you uh, in a group this size, uh, when you walked in this morning, there was probably something that might be nagging at your heart. And maybe something that uh, the devil knows that all he has to do, because he knows human nature, he just needs to bring that up every once in a while just to make you feel defeated make you feel that shame of what used to be that shouldn't be anymore in your life because of that glorious day that Jesus stepped in. We're going to see the next song. It's called The Father's House. In this room, we are able to check that shame, that defeat, those feelings at the door because in the Father's house, that failure doesn't define us. Failure doesn't define you. Father's love is what defines you. So we're going to sing in the Father's house this morning. Weakness is a canvas for your strength. 
shadows coming home. But help us find hope. Love is on the moon when the father's in the room. Prison doors flaming wide. Dead comes to life. Love is on the moon. Good morning and welcome to Epsom Bible Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. Also, thank you for joining us online. Uh, it's uh, great. I, I was uh, just checking online and I saw that Amy Guth is uh, tuned in. She's traveling back. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not sure actually where she's traveling from, maybe from Pennsylvania. So Amy, I saw that you're, you're watching. So uh, just a reminder, wherever you go, you can catch us online. We always stream this service the 1030 service, so you can catch that. Uh, just a couple things really quick. Uh, if you are, uh, if you're here and new, you're here for the first time, please stop by our Connect desk. Let us know that you're here. We have a gift for you. We'd love to be able to, to give that to you and then also have just a record of your attendance and be able to follow up with you later. A uh, few things coming up. One, there is going to be an Ignite outing at Chuckster's this Thursday. And so you, uh, Kim Simon's information is in here. You can, you, they can text you or call you, right? So that's her, her mobile number. Just let her know that you're going to be going. Uh, again, for those of you uh, maybe that are just coming, Ignite is our youth ministry. So that's the junior high, high school. Uh, and we do not meet during the summer regularly, but they do have a couple of these special things going on. So that's uh, this Thursday. And then also there's a game night coming up for the young adults ministry. So we have a, a couple of things going on there. And then tonight, do not forget, tonight is our body life meeting. Uh, so we'd love to have everyone out there. If you can, if you can redo your schedule, whatever you have to do to be here tonight, and we're going to be going over a lot of really exciting things and the future of the church and things like that. Uh, if you can't be here, we will be uh, streaming it online, so we are going to do that, but it's much better in person, so we uh, encourage you to be here uh, for that tonight. All right, what I want to do now is we have a couple of special things we want to do. One is first we want to recognize some graduates. And so we did this in the first hour, and some of these people already came forward. So I'm going to read some names. And Rick, why don't you, Pastor Rick, why don't you come up? And you can help me. You can, you can assist me I can assist, uh, today I if you would like. To yes, you. Yeah, I thought that you would. It's my, so, it's my life goal. I know. I, I, I grant you those life goals. Thank and so you. you're, you're welcome. All right, so let's go through. First, we're going to do high school, okay, high school, and so we'll, uh, we'll bring up the lights so you can see them. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to call your name and then just come down forward and then stay here, okay? So if you're here, we want you to stay here so we can get a picture as well. And parents, All right. too. Uh, yeah, and parents, that's right. We they, don't want to forget parents. Well. That's right. Yeah. We sure did. I was one of those parents, so. All right, high school. Uh, Kira Kokulu, is she here? If she's here, come on down. Nice. Emily Dudley. Quinn Reed. Quinn. And mom and dad. Yeah, and mom and dad. So Quinn Reed, yeah. dad. Come on. Quinn. Uh, Casey Schumann. Casey was here in the first hour. And Jacob Storman. So you have to stay here. You can't go anywhere. That's right. You have to, you have to stay down front. So those are our, our high school grads. Congratulations, Sean. You can, you can represent. Yeah. And then in college, 
we have Naomi Harris. Is she, is she here in the, she was here in the first hour. She is not here for the second hour. Uh, Ryan Latterella is, was here. He's uh, serving right now. And Rachel Lavalley is not here. She's, where was she? Arizona? Arizona? Okay. Uh, also made, uh, uh, Michael had let me know that Isaiah Allen also graduated as well. And so uh, he's not here, but Isaiah. Okay. Yeah. And then. Have we got, Gabriel, did you graduate this year? Come on. All right, come on forward. And mom, mom, come on up too. We'll get your Bible forthwith. And then our postgrad, so uh, with the master's, Sarah Harkness, uh, Scott Harris with MBA, Tyler Pond, Ty Pond with the MBA. Come on, come on down, come on down with the baby. Come on, Rebecca, come too. You are the two, Rebecca. And Matt Simon with his PhD. So uh, a lot of uh, incredible things. Graduates here. That. Excuse me, that's Dr. Matt Simon. Oh, right, doctor. I have to make sure I say that correctly now. Dr. Matt Simon. All right, well, Rick, why don't you go ahead and pray for our graduates and kind of this culmination uh, that we have here. Lord, thank you so much for just uh, allowing us to celebrate this uh, transition of of, uh, life. Lord, for those from from, uh, high school now looking to college or looking to life skills or life plan that, that you give them wisdom, Thank you for the parents that God, is. I know that every one of them can remember when these kids were just babies and here they are now uh, looking for life goals. And then, Lord, those out of college and uh, master's degrees and then Matt Simons with his Ph.D., thank you, God. I, I know for Tyler here that he uh, worked on it while having a job, while his wife's having a baby and all that's going on, and yet, Lord, disciplined his life that way. So thank you for that. Thank you for these men and women. Thank you for these parents. May we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. You guys can have a seat. All right, the next thing that we want to do is we have a team leaving for Uganda this coming week. So I'm going to right now have the Nicholsons. So Neil and Jennifer Nicholson, come on up. I, I thought I saw them. Did it? Oh, oh, Neil's not here. Is Neil prepping for the trip? Sort of. Okay. Uh, Michael Allen. So we have the Garlands, Rick and Ellen are heading, Michael Allen is heading, uh, Neil and Jennifer are heading. Uh, Can we do a different, can you give me a little bit different light? Yeah, so we make sure we get that. Ella too. And oh, and Ella, is Ella with, okay, okay. And then we also have uh, Jeffrey Philbrick, who is the the headmaster principal at Jesse Remington High School going with the group as well. And a number of things uh, that they're going to be doing. Uh, Rick is going to be teaching a, uh, with a pastor's conference. He and Neil will be involved with that. Michael's going to be teaching uh, a safety uh, group. They're going to be going over uh, some safety uh, different protocols and things. So he's going to be doing that. Do you guys see Mike? teaching the safety over there in Uganda. It's going to be so much fun. I'm sitting in in the class. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. That's him smiling right now. So that's, that's what's exciting. Uh, and then Ellen is going to be doing a ladies' conference. Uh, and so there's just a lot of different stuff that's going to be going on. So I'm going to pray for this team as they're going to be heading out on, is it Thursday? You guys have a Ellen and I leave on Friday, and then you guys leave the following, the following Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity that our church has to uh, be a part of this mission trip, and uh, for those that are going, Lord, we pray for safety, and that uh, it'll just be an incredible uh, team-building trip for them, as well as the ministry opportunities. For those of us that are staying back, may we remember to uh, hold them up in prayer, to remember them and uh, on a daily basis as they are going to be serving in Uganda. We thank you for just the fact that uh, Epson, New Hampshire, this church in Epson, New Hampshire can have a, a role and an influence in Uganda and what a great opportunity it is. Lord, we, we thank you for the missionaries that we have there, uh, David and Amanda, and just the opportunity that we have to support them. May this be encouraging to them as well. And so we commit this team to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. All right, we're going to move into uh, the next part of our work. We have one more song to sing, and then we're going to get into the Word again with a character study uh, today, and it's going to be on uh, the glory of God. And so let's sing one more song, and then we'll get into the rest of the service. So uh, this morning, 
I'm just thankful that we have Pastor Rick and Pastor Carl. Are you not thankful for the comic relief that we receive from them? And I think somebody in the first service called it Bert and Ernie. I don't know. Are you glad you're going away for two weeks? Carl and I are going to be on vacation. I love Pastor Rick and Carl. Um, this morning, I was thinking about this next song. It's uh, an old hymn, and if you grew up in the church, uh, you would have sung this probably every Sunday. To God be the glory. I was thinking um, the this past week, anybody ever have deal with back pain? Anybody have that? Okay, okay. You know how debilitating uh, back pain can be. Um, the things that you're so used to doing, like just sitting down and getting up, can be a little bit uh, labors. So it's one of those things where you, uh, if you're very active, it can be very humbling when you go to pick something up that was never an issue before and now you have to ask for help in, in lifting something and moving things around and just trying to walk around the house. It can be difficult. And so it slows you down causes you to be thankful for the days when you weren't suffering like that. There's other things that can do the same thing, but currently I'm dealing with back pain. Think about to God be the glory. How many times in life, in our walk with the Lord, do we knowingly or unknowingly steal God's glory? When we do something and we want to take the credit for what was done rather than giving the glory to God in the way that he has to come along and humble us so that we look to him and give him the glory for all the great things that he has done. This is a great song. If you don't know this hymn, you're going to learn one this morning. And if there's ever a hymn that you would keep in your repertoire, of your own personal songs, this would be one of them. Let's all stand together as we sing our version of To God Be the Glory. second verse, just take a minute, think about the great things that God has done for you. Just reflect on that. The first one that could come to your mind is that you're here this morning. You're here able to sing this hymn, To God Be the Glory. We can gather together as believers to God be the glory. Amen.
to sing and just to bring you the glory to say thank you God we praise your name and it is what you have asked us to do and Lord I just pray that we will continue to praise you and honor you and I pray this morning as we open your word we'll continue to do that as well we thank you again in Jesus name amen take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 19 Psalm chapter 19 and Pastor Carl did an awesome job, but I want to put an emphasis, an exclamation point on tonight. Please, if I could command you, demand you, I implore you, I beseech you to come uh, to be here at 5 p.m. to our Body Life meeting. Now, if you're new here to Epsom Bible Church, we don't talk about church business or direction or focus or changes in the church uh, on, Sunday, on the morning service. We want to make this worship as much as we can. And so that's what we're doing, and tonight we're going to talk about 10-year goals, talk about building programs, we're going to talk about some very, very major things, and I implore you to be here. I know it's going to be a nice day, but thunderstorms are going to happen at 4 p.m., so it's going to mess up your schedule. Be here, okay? And uh, if for whatever reason you cannot be here, we're going to live stream it, but we're going to do Q&A, so you're going to have questions, you're going to want to be here. If you have children, bring strollers in. I don't have a problem with that, and I think children ought to be here to listen, too because this is something that they can learn from. So again, I'm just imploring and asking you to be here tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, as we do a presentation and also have an opportunity for you to do question and answers with that. And now, Pastor Jamie, you know, Bert and Ermy, I can laugh at that. I, I can do that. But, but, I, but I can also say that, you know, he's talking about his back pain, um, w which I just want you to know that he, he didn't tell you where he got it from, but he, uh, he's 50 years old and he's playing softball like he's 30. Okay, I, I'm just, I'm just saying. You know, you guys sometimes, you know, you 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 you're, you know, you're one age in your body and you're another age in your head. You, you ever notice that? I know some of you go, boy, you're not showing any compassion. I, I'm like a mother. Do you ever, do you ever notice that? Do you ever have your mother say, don't do something and you did it, and and then she goes, see, you got what you deserved. You know, you skinned your knee or. Yeah, I know. It's like, it's like com that commercial on TV, one of my favorites. Is a, it's a mother. She's sitting on the couch, and the, you hear the child in the background going, Mom, I'm bleeding. She said, get a Band-Aid. But I'm really bleeding. Get two Band-Aids. I mean, that was uh, her answer to that. So anyways, we're thankful for that. And Jennifer, I'm thankful that you're here. And uh, make sure that uh, I'm apparently that, that Neil apologizes before. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's... You had a fight or something? Is that what the rumor is? Can we start one here? Wouldn't that be terrible? I already did, so that was wrong of me. I'm sorry, but I'm glad. I mean, I love, we'll have a great, I know. But uh, we're really looking forward to uh, Jennifer and, uh, and Neil and Ella. I'm looking forward to Ella. You know, they're teenagers. She just, she graduated from eighth grade. And I'm having so much fun with her, and she has no idea what to think about me right now, does she? We're in Uganda. Which means in the last, next couple of weeks, uh, I will not be here, but uh, doesn't mean when I'm not here, you can leave, okay? We got, we got things planned for you, and Pastor Jamie and uh, Pastor Carl hopefully will be here, uh, but they'll be here. And uh, next couple of weeks, uh, Tim Patterson, do you know that name? 
he'll be uh, preaching. Some of you new here, he has been a uh, part of Epsom Bible Church for 30 some odd years. He's been on staff. He's, he's, I, I call, he's one of our Secret Service uh, uh, elders and does all kinds of stuff for us. And so he'll be here. Pastor Carl will be speaking so, uh, during that time. So we have a lot of, we got everything set and ready to go for that uh, for these next couple of weeks. And so looking forward to a, to a great time uh, there at, um, in Uganda and even here while I'm gone. Well, we've been going through the attributes of God here, and uh, we're at attribute or characteristic of God number 21. And as I said to you a couple weeks ago, that uh, hopefully next year, year after, we'll complete uh, the attributes that I believe that God has shown us in Scripture. And we'll put, hopefully, Lord willing, put up some kind of book form uh, and devotional form for you, because I believe that you ought to, we ought to be meditating on an attribute of God every day. I believe it'll be life changing if you did that. And so that's why I'm going through these uh, just amazing attributes. And I don't believe these are comprehensive. I think God's attributes are infinite. But God, these are the ones that God gave us in Scripture for us to know now. And I believe all eternity we're going to be learning God. We're going to be learning God. We're going to be learning God. And it'll be exciting the things that we learn about God. But what, is it, what do we mean, practically speaking, to us when I say that God is glorious or the glory of God? And my little statement there in your notes is this. I am the most fulfilled when I give God glory. I am the most fulfilled when I give God glory. And, and, or you could really say, I am fulfilled, not even most, but I am fulfilled or only fulfilled when I give God glory. That is when I am fulfilled. Today, many people are looking for significance. They're looking for, uh, how do I fit in this world or my society and or I don't fit in, and, 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 and all these other questions, and I'm here to tell you that you are the most fulfilled when you give God glory. I thought about that, and is the glory of God important today? Well, I, uh, some time ago, I was, I was looking online, and I saw this uh, uh, science uh, demonstration with a Hubble telescope, and I saw that online, and it, and, and it just blew me away, and I want to share that with you this morning. This, this, uh, this demonstration, now it, not Christian, this comes from a secular uh, uh, science program, and I just want to show you this morning a couple of things here. If you look there on, on your uh, screen, and you can't see it really, well, you can see a little bit, you can see the stars there, but what they did was, there's an area about a tenth of the size of the full moon, uh, in that little uh, yellow box up there, appeared to be complete blackness with no stars physical to the naked eye. And then, go on to the next one, there we go. Uh, the, the Hubble, now what they did is the Hubble telescope, what they did is they, went, they looked at the night sky and they looked for within all the sky for a place where it was a black hole, where there was no stars at all, where they could not see anything. And, and they pointed at that, oh, go back again, go back again. Uh, too quick. And then they went, they pointed at it for four months, taking in all the light that they could. So this was a black hole in the sky where there was no stars at all could be seen. Even, even the Hubble telescope couldn't see it, but they trained it for four months. And after four months, here's what they saw in that black hole. Is that not amazing? Now let me share a couple things with that. A couple things... Go ahead and next one, one there. That for each one of that, those images is an entire galaxy. Each one of those little dots of, of, of the, our entire galaxy. And for each galaxy, it, came, it contains one trillion stars. Now, take a breath from there. This is a black hole in the middle of the universe. And, and it, they search out the, the universe. All these images are there. And each image is an entire galaxy, and each galaxy is one trillion stars, and each star has its own solar system with stars in, in matched. Isn't that amazing? Go on to the next one there. And then there is over 10,000 galaxies in this photo alone. So you've got 10,000 galaxies, each galaxy with over a trillion different stars in it. Are you, are you getting this? In, in, a, in a black box with nothing in it. And, and so you see that there. You know, you, we go on there and see that, that this is, by the way, and, and this is shown 13 billion light years away, all within a tiny little box. Did that blow you away? Isn't that not amazing? 
with that being said, with all that being said, let me read to you now Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. And I'm, gonna, I, I'm doing it in a, a different translation, but, I, but I, I think it's clear here. Let me just read it to you. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and the words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. The glory of God. I mean, we just look at the sky. And, and again, that, that little demonstration I just shared with you. Secular scientists said, look at this. We found this black hole with the Hubble telescope. We just trained it on it for four months. And then we saw 10,000 galaxies, each one with a trillion stars. And just, whoa. And Scripture says that the whole night proclaims, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. When the Bible speaks of the glory of God, what's it talking about? The doctrine of the glory of God encompasses the magnificence, splendor, and the excellence of all that he is. In fact, as I was studying this, I thought, you know, this should have been the last attribute I do because it's the culmination of all, but yet in the providence of God, we're doing it now, and I think for a reason. But how important is the glory of God to you? And here's my answer. Deep down in your heart, we know that we're made for this. If you're totally disinterested this morning, if you came this morning out of obligation, if you came this morning going, well, I hope we get done soon, or I'm getting bored, or I'm just here because I'm supposed to, I, I, my prayer is that there'll come a day when the concrete is scraped off all that you are, and you'll say, and you will say, I was made for this. This is why I exist. Everything in the universe is pointed to his glory. All the glory that I thought was so attractive isn't, and this is where I want to be for all eternity. What I thought was glory is all husks and ashes. The Bible is right, and I hope that that day will come soon if you don't understand or get this point of view. Hmm. 1 Corinthians 10.31, you know the verse. Many of you know it very familiar, but let me slow it down and just share with you what it says. It says, so whether you eat or drink, you know, all of us, probably in the last 24 hours, have ate or drank something. You said, You've, I've, I've ate or drank something, but just in case you're on a fast or you go, no, no, I haven't. God already figured that out. You're going to say that? And he said this, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, which are the most common things that you're eating and drinking or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God everything what does the word everything mean it means everything I thought of that and I don't know why but I had four grandchildren in my house here last week and I thought of changing diapers I hated changing diapers I hated it I mean so bad that I took one of my children when when my son, when he was little, my wife went away to the market, and, and we lived down in Florida, and so it was summertime, and he just, I mean, his diaper was, uh, it was blessed, you know what I mean? So I took him outside, and I unleashed both latches, and I took the hose, and he ran around. He was having fun. <laughs> but Alan came home during that time, and she wasn't. Well, I don't know why. but even changing diapers to the glory of God. So what's the explanation of the glory of God? Well, if we're talking about the glory of God, we need to know what the word glory means. So I went to the Oxford Dictionary, and it came up with three different definitions, and I, I like all three of them, so they're in your notes. The first one is the magnificence or great beauty. Glory means magnificence or great beauty. It also means high renown or honor won by notable, notable achievements and takes great pl pride or pleasure in. Another angle of his glory is that in everything that he is and everything that he does, God is greater than human description. God, you, you know, I love this statement. Someone said, you cannot exaggerate God. You cannot talk in, in God in superlatives and, and, and overreach. The glory of God is the total dimension of all of his attributes. I love, love this. God has no rivals. The glory of God is his 
going public of his holiness. Last week we talked about the holiness of God being more internal, being the comprehensiveness of who he is, the healthiness of God, and, and his glory is the going public of that holiness that he is. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, it explains it this way. Oh, the depth and the riches of wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That's a rhetorical question. Who has known the mind of the Lord? No one. Or who would be his counselor? No one. Or who would ever gi- who, who's ever given to God that he should be repaid? No one. From, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And God's glory, God demands glory, not because he's arrogant or proud or self-aggrandizing. No, his perfections and all that he does shouts his glory. Ryrie says it this way, what is the glory of God? It is the showing off of God's character. Don't you like that? This is not a thing even, uh, this, this is not a thing even in complex 20th century life, that was written in 20th century life, that cannot be tested by the standard. Does it glorify God? Does it show him off? Therefore, this is an all-inclusive definition of sin. Sin is anything contrary to the character of God himself. That includes anything contrary to what is written, his written word, and everything contrary to his character of the living word or our Lord Jesus Christ himself. In fact, the glory of God is the magnificent theme of all the Bible. It is addressed in every major biblical section related to every biblical doctrine and interwoven through the biblical story. It is so central to Scripture that the story of the Bible is the glory of God. John Piper says it this way, that God's glory is a unifying theme or goal of history. Psalm chapter 29, verse 2 says it this way, Aside from the Lord, the glory, uh, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord and the beauty of his holiness. Now, the glory of God can be used as an adjective, as a noun, or a verb. God is glorious as an adjective. It reveals his glory as a noun, and to be glorified as a verb. And God's glory is intrinsic and extrinsic. It's intrinsic in the fact that it's a total comprehensive understanding of all that he is and the attributes of what he is within his internal self. But it's extrinsic, meaning this, that it is shown in creation, it's shown in redemption, it's shown in all that he does in his glory and his honor. Now I say that, and I, and I mentioned before, that I believe that the major theme in Scripture is the glory of God. There is a, a sentiment of, of evangelical uh, believers and pastors and churches out there who will tell you differently. They will say to you that the the central theme of all Scripture is Jesus Christ, is the gospel message, that they are a gospel-driven church. And people ask me all the time, are you a gospel-driven church? And my answer is no. Why? Well, listen carefully to my perspective of that, because I think that a gospel-centered ministry subtly places the focus and priority on man. We're a glory to God-centered church, which includes the gospel of salvation as a primary way that God gets the glory. What I mean is this. Now, last week I said, I think you ought to preach the gospel to yourself every morning as a Christian. I believe it's a vital part of what we are. But the ultimate end of Scripture isn't the gospel. It's the glory of God. And what's one of the greatest ways we can bring glory to God? Bringing people to Jesus, no doubt. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, we often read during Christmas time. But I want to read it today because I think we missed something when we read it during Christmas. It says this, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the field and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then the angel of the Lord stood by them. Now, many times in the Old Testament, angel, the, the angel of the Lord, or an angel would come to, to men and women and speak to them, and, and they were surprised, uh, but they were not fearful oftentimes. But watch this. It says this, the angel of the Lord stood by them, now watch, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Were they terrified of the angel? No, they were terrified by the glory of of God. They were terrified by the glory of the Lord that shone about them. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy 
that will be for all people. Now let's look at the problem of the glory of God. When I say the problem, what I want to steer ourselves to, to our problem when we do not seek the glory of God. Before we do that, I want to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If you're new to Christianity, that's okay. Go, go, to, your, go to the table of contents in, uh, in the beginning of your Bible, and you can look it up. Or if your Bible is on your phone or on your iPad, you can just boop right there and get to it. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now let me give you the background of this. Solomon became king over Israel. David was king. And God said David was a man after his own heart. And God made a promise to David, and it was God's promise to David, that he said, there will not be a king that will be on the throne that will not come from your seed for all eternity. Well, that's a huge statement to make. We, claim it, we call it the, the, the Davidic covenant. And so when, when David was, you know, built his palaces and built his houses, when he secured the kingdom and built all this to himself, and he said, I want to build God a, 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 a tabernacle. I mean, God, God was living, if you will, his presence was in the, a tabernacle, a, a transportable tabernacle, but not a permanent home. And David said, I want to build a permanent home for, for God. And God said, no, you will not. You will not build a permanent home for me, but your son will. But David, you can collect materials for that. And what we find is that David collected, you ready for this? Now, now, now the building itself was 30 by 90. Now, it was a few stories tall, but a 30 by 90 building. And he collected 8,000 pounds of gold. Now, think of that. Gold is almost $2,000 an ounce. 8,000 pounds of gold. And he collected 80,000 pounds of of silver and so much bronze they couldn't even count that and that's what David's contribution was to the temple and then Solomon contributed more to that this building was the most magnificent thing in my opinion that's ever been built in human history and so Solomon builds this temple to God and if you remember we remember we said the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies and then the presence of God made it holy and that's where God's presence was and so the, and there it was, and they were dedicating this temple to God. And now in Second Chronicles 7, verse 1, when Solomon was dedicating the temple, when Solomon finished praying, fire descended from heaven. Boy, don't you like that? Remember when we talked about Elijah when that happened? Fire descended from heaven and consumed the, the burnt offering. Now, this is where my humor comes in, into play. I, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm looking at two priests trying to light the fire under the, uh, you, you know, in the altar because they've got to light the fire. And I could see the, I could see, you know, the one, you know, going to, hey Jacob, can you get that fire started? I'm trying. Hurry up! He's almost done praying. I'm trying to get it, you know, going. You never could get this thing right. You can never, you know, get those sticks together, you know, make smoke. And I'm, I'm sure they're arguing over that whole thing. And finally, after the, the prayer is done, all of a sudden God goes, step aside, guys. Boom! And there it comes, and and uh, it's consumed. Uh, just my humor. Um, but verse one, when the Solomon was finished praying, the fire descended from heaven, and it consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And watch, and the glory of God filled the temple, and the priests were not able to enter the temp Lord's temple because the glory of God filled the temple of the Lord. Can you see that the priests, they started running out? They started, the people were watching. The priests were supposed to be serving, and they weren't serving. They were running out saying, we can't, we can't stay in here. The smoke is, is consuming. We can't breathe. Verse 3, and all the Israelites were watching when the fire descended and the glory of the God came on the temple and they bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. They worshiped and praised God for he is good and his faithful love endures forever. And the king and all the people were offering sacrifices to the Lord's presence. And here it is. I can see some priests going, oh no, I can't serve. Oh no. Can you see the young ones going, well, I'm they're running out going, no, what am I, I, I was told to stay here and I was told to perform this, but I can't do that. I can't, what's going to happen? And they're so consumed about their job that I, I, I could see an, an older priest grabbing him by the arm and going, son, just stand here and watch. This is God. And they got down on their face. They got down as close as they could. And they got to the ground. They started going, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he's God. He is faithful, love endures forever. And they're calling out his name. What an amazing sight. But we're not done. Look at this. The king, verse 4, and the people were offering sacrifices in the Lord's presence. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice. Watch this. 
22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. In this matter, the king and the people dedicated to God's temple and the chief and the priests and the Levites were standing in their stations and the Levites had the musical instruments of the Lord which King David made and gave thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. And when he offered praise to them across from the Levites, the priests were blowing trumpets and the people were standing and they were and the, so that the instruments were loud that the smoke was consuming people were praising it was an amazing sight and you think about that 22,000 cattle 120,000 sheep you say well that's ridiculous it is that's extravagant it is that's exaggerative it is but it's, unless you are worshiping God and it's none of those things you can't exaggerate God. And here is, here is the king Solomon saying, I am giving more and beyond what I can give because I want to worship God. And here we are today, oh, how many times we begrudgingly give God our time. We begrudgingly give God our, our talents. We begrudgingly give God our finances, don't we? You go, but Pastor Rick, don't you see what's going on with the economy? Don't you see that gas prices went over five and they're talking about going over six dollars a gallon? Heating, wait, wait until the heating season comes. And, and 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 food prices, don't you see how and I get that and I see that and I understand it and it's affecting us too, but let me just tell you, you can't outgive God. And here's right here saying, you sacrifice and worship God, God provides. You can't over exaggerate. Now let's fast forward from this scene, 400 years. Take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter 10. Let's fast forward 400 years and see how the glory of God is affecting the worship in Israel. You're going to Ezekiel 10, but let me get to share with you Ezekiel chapter 1. 400 years pass by. The kingdom, you know, splits. The northern kingdom goes into captivity because of their rebellion against God. Southern kingdom sees that, but they, they, they ignore it. That doesn't even affect them, and they keep going into, into rebellion, and they keep sinning against God, and they sin against God, and they sin against God. And so God, th then in 605 B.C., sends the Babylonians to them and captures a bunch of them and takes them away. Then 596 B.C., takes some more of them, and at that point, Ezekiel, which is a prophet of God, goes with them into captivity, and they still sin against God. And 586 B.C., God says, I had enough, and then wipes out the kingdom of Judah. Three chances he gives them. And three times they ignored the chances. In 400 years, they went from worshiping God on their face to the ground, shouting Yahweh God in the, in the, in the smoke, the Shekinah glory of God filled the temple and the, and the instruments played and the people sang and it was a glorious worship. 400 years go by and now here's what's happening. They still have the temple. They're still doing sacrifices. The priests are still functioning, but here's what they have. They don't have worship. They have religion. And they're not worshiping Yahweh God. What they've done is They've made it so functional and cross their knees and dot their eyes that so long as they're there, they can make it look so good, but internally they were carnal. Ezekiel chapter 1, you know, you know what I find there? Before God gives judgment, he shows Ezekiel an incredible vision of God. In fact, someday I'd like to speak on it. It's one of my favorite passages, believe it or not. But it's an amazing, amazing thing. It, Here's Ezekiel, he's, he's, he's in captivity, and God shows him at the Kibar River, shows us this, this great vision of the glory of God, of God on a chariot with a wheel within a wheel, and angels and smoke and all that's going on, and the shining bright lights, and it's coming towards him, and they, he, he hears a sound from the chariot seat, and, and, and it sounds like thunder. And you know what happens at the end of chapter 1? It says he got, on his, he got on his face trembling against the, the glory of God. And God says, fear not. Stand up, Ezekiel. I got a job for you. And then in Ezekiel 10, we see what happens. There was paganism and sin going on. 
And God said he had enough. In Ezekiel chapter 10, look at verse 4. Then the glory of God, where was the glory of God? The glory of God was in the Holy of Holies. It rested in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. It rested on the mercy seat. That's where the glory of God presided. And look at verse 4, chapter 10 of Ezekiel. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherub and of the threshold of the, temp of the temple. The temple was filled with a cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of God's glory. Did you get that? The temple was filled with a cloud, and there was a brightness of God's glory. But here's what it is. The glory of God moved from the Holy of Holies, and it moved to the edge of the temple. God's glory moved and it, you could see it visibly if your eyes were open spiritually you saw the glory you saw the smoke but look what happens nobody noticed or nobody cared verses 18 and 19 then the glory of the lord moved from the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim the cherubim lifted their wings and ascended from the earth that night before my eyes and the wheels were beside them as they went and the glory of God of Israel was above them and it stood at the entrance of the eastern gate of the Lord's house what a breathless sight of seeing the angels move the throne of God from the presence of the glory of God and here it was it was at the temple it was out in the holy of holies and God's glory moved at the edge of the temple and nobody saw nobody cared now he's at the edge of, of, of the whole system right there the eastern gate it, it, the glory of God is there and still we read nobody sees nobody cares in verse 23 then the glory of God rose up from the city and stopped in the mountain east of the city finally it stopped at the mount of olives just east of the city why is that so important let me just tell you that i believe that jesus was riding on that chariot of the glory of the presence of god and he was at the mount of olives and then he rose up to heaven why because it says that someday after the rapture of the church when he comes back and to glory on earth again you know where his feet are going to land on the mount of olives But the glory of God moved out of the temple, moved to the edge, moved to the edge, of the, and then moved away and left the temple. And do you know what happened the next day? Nothing. Nothing was different. People came to sacrifice. Per, priests fulfilled their duty, and the people kept on sinning. No one knew or sensed or cared that the glory of God was gone. They performed their religion and their function just like before because what they had didn't need God do you remember Samson God said I don't want you to cut his hair it's a sign of his obedience to me and I will give him a natural power and Samson had a natural, a natural power Delilah now, here's a trivia question, just so you know. Delilah did not cut Samson's hair. You read it. You study it. She didn't do it. You go, no. Read it. She called someone in to do it. And so two times she did that, and Samson lied to him. So the third time he said, well, my power is in my hair. You cut my hair, and I'll lose my power. Now, listen, the power was not in his hair. Just like we said about the Ark of the Covenant, the power wasn't in the Ark. It was in the presence of God, made it holy. And what gave him his strength was his obedience to God, not his long hair. It was his obedience to God. And when he disobeyed God, that's when the power left. And the power left Samson. And so do you remember that Delilah said, get up the third time. Get up. Your, your enemies are, behind, are upon you. And this verse scares me. It says in Judges 16, 20, that he got up just before, like before, ready to, to, to attack his enemies. Now, listen to this verse. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Could I serve God and not even realize that the power of glory of God isn't on my life? Could there be churches who believe 
and the fundamental truths of God's word of faith, as we would call them that, and they don't have the glory or power of God in their life, but man, they have every X crossed and every I dotted. Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Could something like that happen today? Revelation chapter 2. The Apostle John is writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to seven churches, and these are seven real churches. Specifically in verse 4, he's writing to the church of Ephesus. And here's what God says to the church of Ephesus, verse 4, But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you first, you had at first. You have abandoned your first love. You know, he said, you guys, you've got your theology right, you've got your standards right, you've got your politics right, you've got your, what I mean politics, you've got your elders and your deacons, and you've got all that right, you've got it all right, you, you've got this church, everything buttoned up exactly the way it is, but wait a minute, here's this, i got one thing really against you, what's that? You don't love me! Verse 5, remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What does it mean, remove your lampstand? It can't mean that I'm going to remove your church because the church of Ephesus was around until the 14th century. So what does it mean? Could it mean that the presence of the glory of God would no longer be in the church? Services and activities would go on, but without the power of God, we are more engrossed with our programs and preferences than the God's power and purity. It starts with us losing our passion for the glory of God, and our relationship becomes a religion. Could it happen? And I answer that could be yes. In two years, we're going to be celebrating 200 years here at Epson Bible Church, and I have to believe that in those 200 years, there have been times that we have functioned as a church without the power and glory of God. And the greatest fear that I have and what I pray for is, oh God, if that happens while I am lead pastor here, then may it it be quickly, may we repent of our sin and confess it before you, and may it not be long that we don't restore the power and glory back to you again. But my fear is that as I look around in so many churches that have so much going for them and then so many things right, and they look right and they act right, but they're... The power of God isn't there, and the glory of God isn't central in what they're doing. We wonder why there's no revival. So how does the glory of God affect me? Five things. Number one, God wants us to radiate. Now, I know some of you, that word gets you nervous. Dana Merrill used to work at a at a plant that if someone says he's radiating, that would concern you if you work at a nuclear plant, right? But we need to radiate, which means that we need to shine forth the health and the holiness and give direction. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16 says this, you are the light of the world. That's very interesting because when the glory of God is spoken about in, the, in, in, in the Scripture, two things. It either talks about smoke, which the smoke is, it fills the temple. That's the Shekinah glory of God, if you want to know some technicalities of that. And then there's also light, the brilliance of light. And so when it says here, you are the light of the world, where did you get your light from? You got it from God. The Spirit of God inside you shines forth with light. You're a city situated on a hill, cannot be hidden. No light, no one lights a lamp and puts it underneath a basket, but rather on a lampstand to give it light for all those in the house. In the same way, let your light, the light you got from God's glory through you, shine before others so when they see you, your good works, and they give glory to your Father in heaven. That when you are shining that light out, they say, man, there's something different about you. It's because you're shining not your glory, but God's. Second of all, how does it affect me? It gives you purpose. Sickness and infirmity are tools in the hands of Almighty Almighty God. John chapter 11, verse 4. 
He's speaking about Lazarus, and he said, when Jesus heard it, Lazarus, he said, the sickness is, will not end in death, but watch, but is for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. Wow. Some of you are struggling big time with sicknesses. Some of you have been struggling with cancer. Some of you have been struggling with, with other ailments for years and years and years. And you know what? I, I see this here. And some of you, you know, you, you, you struggle with that. Right now, one of my mentors, the heroes of my faith, my pastor, he came a couple of years ago to church here that went growing up. His name is Pastor Anderson. He has blood clots throughout his body. He's in an immense amount of pain. His daughter said that he would, he lays in bed sometimes and just is in so much pain. And all I want him to know is that his life, and you know what, he, he, there's, he can barely speak, he can barely walk, but he can pray. And his, the way he's handling this is to the glory of God. Perhaps, God, some of you, you got so much pain in your life and so much sickness, and you go in bed and you go into fetal position, you go, I don't see Anyway, that God can get the glory for this. And maybe it's not for you. Maybe you don't understand that people are watching you and seeing how you're navigating this thing and this heartache and this hardship that you're going through. And people watch you going, if they can navigate this with grace and with mercy, wow, what an example to me. Have you ever considered that maybe the purpose of your sickness is to help somebody else see the glory of God? Third thing is endurance. Present suffering doesn't consume us when we believe in the future eternal glory. Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed in this. I get it. Some of you, your suffering is huge. And suffering can be physical or emotional. I love what Dr. MacArthur says. He says this, As followers of Jesus, our suffering comes from men, whereas our glory comes from God. Our suffering is earthly, whereas our glory is heavenly. Our suffering is short, whereas our glory is forever. Our suffering is trivial, whereas our glory is limitless. God has also given us hope that God will rescue us from our old self and from others. 2 Timothy 4.18 says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil work. Have you ever had somebody betray you? Have you ever had somebody do injustice to you? Have you ever had somebody stab you in the back or hurt, and, and, they get away, and they get away with it? And some of you are consumed with bitterness trying to figure out a way to get even. And I give you 2 Peter 4, uh, 4.18, or 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue you from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Get beyond your old self and look to eternity is what he's saying. And then also he talks about contentment. The glory of God can affect you by contentment. All of our needs are met when we sacrificially give to him. Philippians 4, 19 and 20 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Here's a quiz. Ready? It says, My God shall supply how many needs? How many needs? All. Now, you know what that's written? Verse 19 is written after verses 17 and 18. In 17 and 18, the Philippians gave sacrificially. They gave to Paul because Paul was in need, but that created a need for them. By giving to Paul, now they had needs. And Paul said, whatever need that's created in your life because you're giving to God, God says, I'll supply every one of them. That's the promise of that verse. Some of you are going, well, I got needs. Well, maybe you got needs because you didn't plan well or because of emergencies. That's not the context. The context there, when you give and you create a need in your life because you gave, God says, I'll supply all those needs according to, to my glory and riches in Christ Jesus. Now to him, that, now to God the, and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So how are we going to apply this? We can rationalize God. When we don't see the glory of God as our ultimate creative motive, then we become ap apathetic towards God. 
Being in, in the presence of the glory of God moves, changes, and humbles the believer. It does something different in Scripture. Abraham was said, when he saw that we, we came in the glory of God, he became in the dust and ashes. When Job, when he was under the glory of God, he was in dust and ashes. Isaiah, when he was under the glory of God, says, Woe for me, for I am ruined. Ezekiel fell down face first on the ground. Peter said, Go away from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. Paul, when he was had the glory of God experience, he went to the ground, and John fell at his feet like a dead man. And every time the glory of God was manifested in their lives, they shook in fear on the ground. And then God says 70 times in Scripture, fear not. I love that. When we come to God with holy fear, he's quick to respond with holy comfort. So how do we respond? The Bible is not primarily about the church evangelism or redemption. We need to know that. Life isn't about us. The picture on the cover of this puzzle relates to the God's glory and His passion. Humanity isn't the center of the universe. Our value comes when we understand our relationship to the glory of God. Our happiness isn't God's primary pursuit. Colossians 1.27 says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what's the challenge this morning? Three things. Number one, we are hardwired by God to glorify. You are hardwired by God to glorify. We are attracted to things that are glorious. We pursue after things that we believe will satisfy the hunger of glory. People are glory-oriented creatures, and we seek to glorify things. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts, and to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And so here's my question to you that I want you to do homework this week on. How, how are your decisions and life choices influenced by your glory hardwiring? Number two, things created were to be a GPS signal to point us to God. Psalm chapter 8 goes on and says, the Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name and throughout the, all the earth you've covered the heavens with your majesty. And then verse 8, 9, he says it again, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout all the earth. And God created things, they were designed by God, to point us to him. And there's many glorious things out there. Uh, from, from you know, The world is jam full of glory, from trees and flowers to mountains to rich foods to songs to thunderstorms uh, to the sunsets, snowfalls. Uh, all these things bring glo- are, are, are designed to bring glory to God. But when sin entered man... God was thrown out, and then things became the center of us. And instead of letting things bring glory to God, we bring glory to things. My question is, what outward thing, things challenge to steal the glory of God in your life? And third and lastly, sin and self and sin turn us into glory thieves. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ compels us, since we have reached this conclusion that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, so that those who should live no longer should live to themselves, but for the one who died with them and was raised. When we demand to be the center of our world, we turn God's glory into garbage and spiritual gluttony, and our glory dysfunction is because of self. Tozier says it this way, The ancient curse will not go away painlessly. The tough old miser within us will not lie down and die in obedience to our command. He must be torn out of our heart like a plant from a soil. He must be extracted like a tooth from the jaw. My question this morning is this. Are you in need of confession of God's rescuing grace to restore the glory to his name to our life? We were created to bring 
glory to God. And what God wants is that relationship. He wants that love that we bring glory to him individually and as a church. And oh, the times that I said that I great fear that I wake up in the morning going, okay, God, I got my agenda, and here I go as lead pastor of Epson Bible Church, and I move through the day, and at the end of the day, wonder, did I do that without the glory of God in my life? God forbid that Epsom Bible Church would cross our T's and dot our I's and have our theology so specific and correct, and yet you walk in here and we can sing our songs, we can dump our offering into things, we can read Scripture and we can leave, and if we don't sense the power of glory of God, we're playing religion where we don't have a relationship and we're all lost. And my prayer this morning is that you and I remember nothing matters. Nothing matters in your life other than giving glory to God. And there is never a time, there's never a time that you, that you cannot rejoice in the purpose, plans, or person of God, and you could not give him glory. It's a choice. And while we're a dysfunctional family and you got a dysfunctional pastor, no amens, let me just say, in the midst of all this, I trust that the time comes that we do sin and that the glory of God's missing, that it'll be a short time that we confess because I want to be a glory-driven church. Amen? I'll read these verses and pray and we'll work through. Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter in Jude, verses 24 and 25 we read, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, to glory be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. Amen. Lord, this is your word. This is your truth, and you have hardwired every human to bring glory to your name. And we will never be fulfilled as a human if we do not bring that glory to you. And as we mentioned last week, God, bringing glory to you isn't only about works. It's about our beliefs in those works. It's about how we be- what we believe about you and how you let us how we allowed you to change our heart and change our soul and our spirit and all that we are. And then, God, those beliefs come out in good works that bring glory to your name. And so many times, God, we are so focused on the good works that we're not, we're not focused on the good beliefs. Lord, every decision and life choice we make is influenced by this glory hardwiring. And sometimes, God, I let it be used to bring me glory and not you, and that's sin. And I pray that, God, that the things that you have created for us to enjoy that leads us to your glory, may we not stop and give it glory ourselves. And, God, I pray that we will not be glory thieves. And I also pray that this church will not be a glory thief. We're not looking, and guys, we prayed even tonight as we talk about the future of this church and buildings and that, that God, the primary force that drives us is what direction will bring you glory. What is the most effective and efficient way that we can do that? Nothing else matters. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you all stand for a second? Pastor Jamie, can you come up here? Grab a microphone. I want to sing just one song a cappella. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Let's just end, end that. And can you just sing it, not for your neighbor, not for yourself. Would you lift your heart, maybe lift your head? Maybe you want to kneel. Maybe you want to, I don't know how you want to do it. But let's end this morning 
was giving him the glory. Would you do that? Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Glorious. Praise God. Why don't you know that Ellen and I love you? We're headed off to Uganda. We're going to have a blast. And uh, we'll see you here in a few weeks. May we leave here thinking and meditating on how can we give God the glory. We'll see you tonight at 5 p.m. God bless.